Good afternoon, everyone. I am most pleased to introduce my friend Catherine Gale as our speaker today. Um, I have had the privilege of hearing Catherine speak on several occasions and said to our uh, program committee, this is a must. So I am glad you are here today. Let me give you just a little bit of background about Catherine. She is the fourth generation president and CEO of her family owned company, Gale Foods. Catherine led the company's aggressive growth strategy for many years. As many of us who grew up in Milwaukee know, Gale has been around for a long time. In fact, it was founded in 1896, and it is a food manufacturing company that produces dairy products such as cheese sauces, puddings, and other dairy-based beverages. Perfect for Wisconsin, wouldn't you say? The company has almost $250 million in sales and over 300 employees, and in 2012, Gale Foods was number 43 on the Wisconsin 75, an annual ranking of the largest closely held companies headquartered in Wisconsin. In 2013, Gale was number 64 in dairy foods, listing on the top 100 dairy companies in the United States. Catherine oversaw the acquisition of Gale Foods by a private equity firm in March of 2015. Catherine is a graduate of the University of Notre Dame, and she holds an MA in education from the Catholic University of America and an MBA from Northwestern's Kellogg Graduate School of Management. In 2010, she was nominated by President Obama to serve as a member of the Board of Directors of what we know as OPIC, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, and she also serves on the CEO Fiscal Leadership Council of the Campaign to Fix the Debt. She has been a member of the Economic Club of Chicago since 2000. In 2013, Catherine was honored here locally by the Biz Times with the Bravo Entrepreneur Award, and she's also been included many times in the Business Journal's listing of influential Milwaukee business leaders. Catherine is a board member of the Marcus Corporation and a former board member of the Joffrey Ballet, Public Allies, and the Fay Gale Conservation Foundation. Today she's going to talk to us about U.S. competitiveness and the state of our democracy. I'm most pleased to welcome her. Please join me. Very good to be here. Thank you, Nancy, Jan, Linnea. And thanks to all of you who actually decided to come out on a beautiful Wisconsin summer day to hear a speech entitled The Impact of Political Discord on the Economy. And I also really want to mention that I appreciated very much saying the Pledge of, the Alle of Allegiance at the beginning of this meeting. Very unusual, and as you'll see from my speech, there are a few things that I'm more passionate about than the state of our republic. So that was a pleasure. I think you could count yourselves as being slightly more lucky than my family, because I actually talk about this stuff at home a lot. Um, when my daughter Alexandra was about six, she would basically heard enough, and she said to me, Mommy, I'm a Republican, or maybe a Democrat." I thought that was pretty fabulous. And then last week I was describing, she's nine now, and last week I was describing all of our presidential candidates and the state of the race and everything. And when I got to Jeb Bush and Hillary Clinton, she said, hey, that sounds like a monarchy. <laughs> so she's pretty on top of it. She couldn't be here today. Um, otherwise, it did take her to one other speech, and at the end she said, you know, I didn't really get that much except that Washington doesn't work very well. So that's going to be the theme today. But this did remind me what she had to say of a quote from Benjamin Franklin. When Benjamin Franklin was leaving the Constitutional Congress, a woman asked him, so Mr. Franklin, what did you give us? A monarchy or a republic? And Benjamin Franklin replied, a republic if you can keep it. So fast forward to today and to the state of our republic. How many of you have ever said, 
Washington is broken. I've said it, okay, see some hands, more times than I can count. But today I'd like to strongly suggest something very different. It turns out that Washington isn't broken. In fact, Washington works exactly how it's designed to work. And it delivers exactly the kind of results that it's incented to deliver. I'm going to come back and pick up that thread in a moment. But first, I'd like to talk about what's at stake in this conversation, why it matters whether our republic functions well or not. It matters, of course, for many reasons, but core among them is the effect on our economy and on US competitiveness. So I'd like to define how I'm using the word competitiveness. In this case, the US, or any country for that matter, is competitive to the extent that businesses in that country can compete successfully in the local economy and, and the and is very important, these businesses at the same time support high and rising standards of living for their employees. Both criteria need to be met for a country to be truly competitive. A country isn't competitive if it's only succeeding in half that definition. So for example, if your businesses are succeeding, but average employees are not, then that's not sustainable. Conversely, if a country artificially were able to support a higher standard of living, which wasn't supported by real economic activity in private sector businesses, then that's not sustainable either. We're always going to be looking for the coexistence of these two criteria. Harvard Business School, who defined competitiveness, puts out a report on US competitiveness every year. This year's report was titled, An Economy Doing Half Its Job. Their point is, our current economy is working very well for businesses, but not quite as well for employees. They're concerned, as are so many, that our economy is not truly competitive and isn't creating opportunities for everyone, businesses and employees, at the same time. And let's not forget, this is a report from Harvard Business School. So their perspective is, I think, very unique to the conversation. They also, at the same time every year, analyze the foundations of competitiveness. And here's how that works. They send a survey out to their 10,000 alumni that um, asks their opinion on the 20 elements that most influence competitiveness of any national economy. And they're asked to rate the US as compared to our competitors, other countries that could grow businesses if they didn't take place in the United States. So I'd like to look at those results with you for a moment. And you actually, I'm going to turn to a slide here, but you actually also have a handout on your, uh, at your seats. So I'll clear this chart for you. So in the upper right quadrant, which is bright green, you see elements of competitiveness where the US is considered strong and is improving relative to our competition. Then in the lower right quadrant, kind of, yeah, greenish, uh, you see elements where the US is strong but deteriorating, getting weaker relative to our competitors. And in the lower left quadrant, the red, you see where the US is weak and getting weaker. Now, when I first saw this, I was absolutely blown away by the chart. Take a look at the bottom left quadrant. What do you see way, way at the bottom? Political system. Our political system is viewed by these business leaders and by Harvard Business School as the second biggest weakness of our economy. And it's viewed as deteriorating at a rate faster than any other single element of competitiveness. This is just crazy to me. America is supposed to be the shining city upon a hill. This is the country that made the world safe for democracy. We beat the Nazis. We won the Cold War. We sent men to the moon. We gave generations of families the opportunity to live better lives than their parents before them. Post-World War II, do we think that the political system would have been in this same position on the graph? Absolutely not. And equally importantly and very concerning 
If we look at all the other elements in the bottom left quadrant, those also rated weak and deteriorating, we see the tax code, regulation, K-12 education, and we see they're really government problems, which means they're, of course, our problems too. These elements of competitiveness will never again be strengths for America until we have a high-functioning government that knows how to solve long-term problems. The dysfunction in our political system has a really high cost. It's undermining U.S. competitiveness. And U.S. competitiveness is the engine that creates opportunities for every one of, this in, every one of us in this room, in our city, in our state, and our country. So let's go back now to the perfectly designed government that I mentioned before. How can it be perfectly designed and let yet deliver these kind of results? And the answer to that is, as I found out, it's not actually designed for us as citizens and voters. In fact, the system has been designed and fine-tuned over time for the benefit of two private gain-seeking organizations, and that's our political parties. Republican and Democrat. I, my, my friend, Mickey Edwards, who's a former congressman from Oklahoma, wrote a fabulous book about this, and he actually titled it, The Parties Versus the People. His, uh, he told his publisher he thought it was kind of harsh, and then his publisher said to him, well, did you read what you wrote? <laughs> So uh, I'm very indebted to Mickey for most of what I'm sharing with you today. And as Mickey describes it, while we're here being regular you know, citizens going about our day jobs, which is to grow and improve our own private organizations, there are also political parties whose day job is to figure out how to grow their organizations. And that seems reasonable and rational, and nothing's wrong with it. We all want to grow our organizations and improve our ability to act on behalf of certain stakeholders. And that's a normal process. But it turns out that there's actually quite a problem when we essentially outsource to these private gain-seeking organizations functions that really belong to the public. Functions such as access to the general election ballot and the legislative process. And by outsourcing these public functions, we, which I'll describe in more detail in a moment, we prioritize the growth and the power of political parties over the interests of citizens. And crucially, we also prioritize the short-term short interests over long-term success of our country. So a quick disclaimer before we go into some more detail. I'm absolutely not criticizing any individual politicians here. I'm not criticizing policy positions of Democrats and Republicans. And I'm not criticizing the existence of political parties. I think it's phenomenal when people who are passionate about the direction of the country come together to engage in our political process. So I support that. But what I am talking about today is the problems in the system that we're all caught up in, the parties, and our elected officials, all of us, including talented, patriotic, well-intentioned elected officials who want to be able to do the right thing for the country. The system isn't working for them either. So coming back to Mickey Edwards, he tells a great story about his service on the House Committee for Foreign Aid. One of the uh, responsibilities of that committee, and it makes sense, is that they get to decide who should get foreign aid. And a criteria that they use is, is this country a democracy? And that's totally rational. I mean, we want to support democracy around the world. So I'm going to just quote Mickey when he tells his story. So I, Mickey, thought, what if a country came and said, well, you know, we have elections and we're a democracy. But then when you look into the country, it actually turns out that they've set up a system where small groups of insiders sometimes as small as one-tenth of one percent of the population decide who can be on the ballot. And then insiders in that country can also work it out that some people who might vote against them won't be able to vote in that particular election. Would we want to give foreign aid to that country? And the answer, of course, is no. But as Mickey then says, that's us. That's the United States of America.
the US political system doesn't really function how we think it functions. I'm gonna give you three examples. First, elections and access to the ballot. Second, redistricting. Third, the legislative process, so actually governing. And in all three, our political system works substantively differently than what most of us have assumed over time. So let's talk first about elections. So think back to when Joe Biden uh, became vice president in 2009, then his Senate seat was open in Delaware. And there's a guy named Mike Castle who was considered a shoe in for that seat. He'd been a congressman, he'd been their governor, and he was fully expected to be the next senator from the state of Delaware. So he takes the next step, he runs in his Republican primary, and he loses. And it was shocking. Some of you may even remember it. It was national news. He lost to a woman named Christine O'Donnell who got 30,000 votes out of a state of one million people. So that's not a problem, hopefully, for Mike Castle. It's a primary. He could turn around and put himself forward in the general election in November. He could go to the general election, which he likely would have won because he was really popular and was the likely choice of the majority of voters in the entire state of one million people. But the problem that Mike Castle faced was that Delaware has this really weird law, and it's called the sore loser law. What that says, as you're sort of figuring out, is that if you run in your party's primary and you lose, you cannot have your name on the general election ballot in November. So effectively, in Delaware, 30,000 people told one million people that they couldn't elect the most popular politician in their state who likely would have won if he had been able to be on the ballot. The Delaware voters didn't have that choice because party primaries control access to the general election ballot. They control our choices, and that's a choice for a US senator who decides if we go to war, what our taxes are, who the Supreme Court judges are. A sore loser law is a law, as I've just noted, which states that the loser in a primary can't then run as an independent in the general. States can accomplish this by having a specific law or by having registration dates that essentially make it impossible to run if you lose in the primary. So the question is, the sore loser law, which allows the private political parties to tell the people of the state who can be on the ballot, how many states have that law? It's a weird law, right? It seems undemocratic to me, kind of crazy. 46 states, and we live in one. Remember when Joe Lieberman, who was senator from um, Connecticut, and he was Al Gore's running mate, he lost his 2006 primary, but then he ran as a third party candidate in the general election and he won, meaning that he's the guy that the voters of Connecticut wanted to be their senator. They had that choice because Connecticut is one of the four states that don't, that al will allow you to be on the general election ballot even if you lose the primary. There's something else that you should know about partisan primaries. They're a big reason why so many people show up at the general election and think, I don't really like my choices. You see, elections are really decided in the primary. And voters who turn out for partisan primaries can tend to be more ideological than the electorate as a whole. Therefore, to make it through a partisan primary, candidates very often have to shift more right or more left than the voters as a whole really want. The influence of the partisan primary also extends to legislative process, so to actual governing. Once you're elected and you finally get to governing, which is then your chance to do the right thing, you may find out that if you don't govern the way your party wants you to govern, you could be threatened with a primary. It's the, we're going to primary you. And this gets reported in the media. If you watch what happens in DC, someone does something and it's reported that so-and-so is being threatened with a primary. The translation of this hypothetical is that, okay, if you are part of a bipartisan effort to solve a significant long-term problem for the country, which would almost always, because if it were easy, we would have done it, it would always involve compromise, tough choices, 
And if you're part of that, and some part of the solution compromises a party position, the party can primary you with someone to your left, if you're a Democrat, who's going to adhere in the party primary uh, campaign to the party line, or someone to your right if you're a Republican, someone who will do what the party platform calls for. So we can start to understand why people who want to do the right thing need to look over their shoulder to their, part, to their party primary, which is going to happen every two years for the, for the House, and wonder what their trajectory is in that primary. And we can start to understand why so little gets done in DC. The second example of our partisan system that I want to talk about is redistricting. So as you know, we all have our congressional districts, and they were originally drawn to reflect the goal that the, our congressman would be, our congressperson would be one of us and know about our concerns. And then over time, these districts have gotten redrawn. And it's, the process to do that is a little different in every state, but in general, the states effectively give control of the redistricting, most states effectively give control of the redistricting process to what, whoever controls the state legislature. So it's not usually, except in some states, a nonpartisan for the benefit of the people kind of process. Now both parties do this whenever they have the chance. If you take a state that's controlled by Republicans at redistricting time, they're going to analyze which huge amounts of voter data, how everybody votes in the entire state, and then they're going to draw lines to get the most strategically advantageous set of districts. So specifically, if it were Republicans, and remember both parties do that, they will draw lines in a way that puts as many Democrats into as few small number of Democrat districts, and then those will be safe Democratic seats. And then they'll draw as many districts as possible, as many as they can, that would be safe Republican seats. So I want to show you an example of how this happens. Oops, here we go. This is a seventh district in Pennsylvania. So this takes us from the 83rd Congress, looks like the congressperson lives among these people and knows about their concerns. Take it to the 113th Congress and this is the shape of that district with one congressperson representing it. Now, I have to tell you, I don't even know who drew this. I don't know if it's drawn to be safe for Republicans or drawn to be safe for Democrats. I can tell, and you guys can tell too, that it's drawn to be safe for someone because otherwise it wouldn't make any kind of sense. Um, and what this means now is in this district, whenever uh, the, the election is always happening in the primary, so whoever this district is safe for, whoever wins the primary, will then automatically win the general. Partisan redistricting which we see here, and oh, I have to say for a moment, you know where, um, that's called gerrymandering, you guys have heard that term, and that came from one of the original uh, sort of creators of this optimizing idea that happens over time, and he created, I think he had a last name of Jerry or something, and he created a district that looked like a salamander, so they put these together and called it gerrymandering. So partisan redistricting and partisan primaries then are key tools that are used to control the election process. And it effectively moves our elected officials away from the center and further to extremes. And this, as you might imagine, makes governing difficult. So that brings us to our third example of the partisan system, which is governing, which is the point of the whole process, of course. So once you get elected, you take an oath. And you're representing, at that point, the United States of America, all the people in your district or your state. Oops, that, that's what I'm supposed to move to. Whether they voted for you or not, you're now representing all of them. But in reality, the parties can continue to wield power over day-to-day -day governing as well. Did you know, I didn't know this, but you can look it up. We can't get a picture of it because you're not allowed to take pictures on the floor of the House, but in the House, of representatives, there's two lecterns. There's a Democrat, oh, I'm on, the, this is the left. There's a Democrat left lectern, and it is indeed on the left, and there is a Republican lectern. And when you speak, you speak at your party's lectern. 
you don't move over to the other side to talk about coming together on some bipartisan deal. And then, if you need to take a break, you go to the Democrat cloakroom or you go to the Republican cloakroom. And as we may remember, if we think really far back to civics, or some of you may not have forgotten this, I had you know, reasonably forgotten some of this before I got reinterested. Much of the work of governing happens in committees, and the committee assignments are given by the parties. I've been told that the assignments are based, at least in part, on whether the person in question is going to do what we, the party, want you to do. And then, if the party gives you this committee, we can take you off the committee if you're not doing what we want you to do. So this would be normal behavior, of course, for a private organization, but it's absolutely not helpful for bipartisan problem solving. And the net result of these three examples are distortions in our democracy. And we see those results every day. So now the good news is that we can change it. The Constitution has absolutely nothing to do with partisan primaries or the way committee assignments work in Congress. So these are just made up rules, made up over time by people playing an inside game. And we can change them. This is our democracy. I have a friend, Charlie Whelan, and he's involved in this movement. And he calls the reform movement an insurgency of the rational. I love that. So we also call it political innovation. And there are a lot of great organizations working in this space. And I'll mention a couple of them. Some, some of you will have heard of some. You can also find them on my website. There's no labels. There's the Independent Voter Project, the Centrist Project. These are great organizations. Some of them are small. But even when an organization is small, if it has a fabulous idea, it's worth getting on board. We can think of any great brand, Levi's, McDonald's, Boeing, Coke. There was a time when those companies were an idea with one, two, th maybe three people in a garage or an office, and they became enormous global brands. They made it happen because they had a product that consumers wanted. So if we look at our political system, Congress's approval rating is less than 20%. We're crying out in this country for political innovation. People want something different. And I believe political innovation is both an idea whose time has come and the defining challenge of our times. So because of what's at stake, which is US competitiveness and opportunities for all Americans, I would invite you in this room to consider joining the call for political innovation. We should never forget that our country was founded on a great political innovation. The republic entrusted to us by Benjamin Franklin and our other founders is ours to shepherd and to keep. So I'd like to end with a quote from a favorite teacher of mine. Real power occurs when we know that we have something to say about the way things are, that we have a voice, that we have access to the state of affairs beyond just reporting on them. Our republic, our democracy, absolutely cannot succeed as a spectator sport. Thank you very much.